Good evening. The meeting is now reconvened to open session. The board would like to remind the public this meeting is being audio and video recorded. It is also available via live stream for the public through the links found on the front page of the RUSD website. The board met previously for closed session. Trustee Hupp, will you please read the action taken by the board? In closed session, the board voted to approve the terms of a settlement agreement for the Office of Administrative Hearing, OAH case number 20220307210, student number 06082022-10, and to authorize the superintendent to execute the agreement on behalf of the district. The vote was unanimous. And in closed session, the Board voted to approve Scott Collins for the position of principal <laughs> at Whitney High School. The vote was unanimous. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Dr. Limoges, will you please introduce item 5.1, an update on tentative agreement between RTPA and RUSD. Emily, is this not on? Check. Okay, I'm going to stand over the podium now. Um, Emily Thomas and Travis Pochette, would you please join me up here? And <clears throat> I'd like to start to thank both uh, uh, Roger and the board for giving us this opportunity to kind of entertain uh, an unorthodox approach to um, kind of celebrating our settlement uh, that we recently had. And we wanted to do it quicker than uh, we were able to actually get it presented here to the boards. So you will actually vote and ratify on all the different elements uh, in the June 22nd meeting. But as time goes, people had vacations and wanted to make sure that I had an opportunity to, to just uh, celebrate this and kind of uh, declare this because the public, members of the board, members of cabinet, uh, our respected teachers and all staff members within the district, um, have all been part of what has been an arduous journey, to say the least, in regards to our negotiations. And over the last four years, and that's only basically what I can speak to, is um, there's been a lot of work that's gone into uh, trying to change the trajectory of negotiations, change the trajectory of the, of, um, the relationship between RTPA and the district, and as well to uh, present a new front uh, to the public who entrust us all with their kids that they send us to. Um, though I can share with you from being in there every day for four years, I get the opportunity to see incremental change and things going in the right direction. Um, what is delightful now is the opportunity to share, not that everything is fixed and everything is perfect, but there's evidence for all kinds of people with the settlement of a contract before the end of the school year to move forward. Um, and really it was done through a long process of looking at how we can do interest-based discussions, how we can be uh, more um, problem solving together as a team, how we can be more transparent, be more collaborative, more uh, communicative, and that's taken all members, not just teachers, but my colleagues on campus. Um, and we finally got the opportunity to see the, the fruits of some of our rewards this year. The work that we've done in labor management, um, three of you, have, some have sat, some currently sit on this, the work that we've done around uh, relationship building, the work that we did uh, seeing other district processes and coming up with kind of a new financial matrix, uh, which we're calling the fair share, which is more a formulaic baseline to starting negotiations. Um, and what has been really great, and I wanted to, to highlight just a couple things, and then I'll, I'll promise I'll be quiet. Um, I wanted to highlight just the, all the efforts that have went into just working on becoming fully transparent and collaborative in regards to the budgeting process that we've, and in doing so, that takes great risk. Uh, it takes great risk from business services to make sure that things are user friendly. It takes great risk in just time to learn this, it's a complex system um, of how educational finance works, 
but the mere fact that uh, you know on the day that we settled in previously we were looking at all the same documents that many of you do when we make some decisions on this um, and I really applaud um, uh, RTPA's ownership into not just the, the great things that we happen, but also their ownership in the deficit reduction, which was very important to the board and obviously us as a whole to be fiscally solvent. And they were not just, they were not just participants in that occurring, they were full on collaborators on this. And so um, in being brief, I wanted to have this opportunity just to celebrate a little bit. Rick, that's, this is brief. I, like to, I don't get to celebrate many things. Um, at this but I wanted to do a couple special thanks even though there's so many people that deserves thanks you know specifically the board and Roger and the cabin all the work I wanted to thank a couple people specifically first of all I wanted to thank Barbara one of these are yours And really that goes to uh, Barbara and her entire team of business services for the amount of hours they put, you know, creating documents and working on figures. The second person I want to thank is uh, Emily Thomas, who um, <laughs> her efforts on understanding and digging into the budget so fully, and I don't even know if I told you this, made my negotiating team better because we no longer we had to be responsible just for the 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 level of knowledge that you have and obviously countless meetings with with Travis and working through problems I appreciate that as well and I'd also like to uh, thank my negotiating team um, you know Matt Murphy Amanda Makis Beth Davidson who's behind us uh, Michelle Cannon has not been an active uh, member this year as much but has been very supportive and looking at language and making sure that we're solvent so um, I'm obviously very proud of just to see kind of where we're going and where the difference between where we came from and where we are today so I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to kind of babble at you a little bit <laughs> unofficially knowing that uh, June 22nd I'll be bringing all this and really the next phase in this is um, working with CSEA and working with all the other units to present everything to you hopefully by the 22nd, knock on wood. So thank you for the time. So I'm gonna use my RTPA time for now and then we're gonna leave. So <laughs> we're looking forward to that part of it. Good. So, um, But uh, uh, along with all the acknowledgements Tony mentioned, um, I, I do want to send a, a specific acknowledgement to Superintendent Stock for joining us in bargaining. It's never a room that like people are like, yeah, let me go, you know, um, especially the last few years. Um, but his presence there, it just sent, it just brought a tone and a message of uh, severity and of importance and of collaboration to the room. So I really want to acknowledge that he and I have had a lot of conversations both before and after those meetings. And it, 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 the, like Tony said, all the fruits of all this are really coming full circle. Um, there's something about sending members off into summer with a guarantee of you're gonna start school focused on teaching and learning and not all the other stuff that we've been so stuck on in so many years past. So um, I shared with Tony today, I haven't had a chance to share it with our entire membership, but um, this is the first ever uh, unanimous ratification from our membership. Um, we had just shy of 400 members, 100% uh, yeses in that. So That's I think awesome. that just goes to speak to everybody else's ownership, at any, wherever they are as a stakeholder in, in this process and the results of it and all those things that go along with it. Um, also want to, let's give a big shout out to the state because they're putting a lot of money into education finally. Yeah. Um, and so Tony mentioned it, the, the ownership of, of deficit and things like that. The state's given us some great tools and resources to work on that and give us some, some actual things to, to work with. So um, hopefully that will keep and continue in future as well. Um, and then uh, again, all the people in the room. Um, our bargaining team is made up of elementary teachers, special educators, middle school teachers, high school teachers, and it is no easy task being out of your classroom, especially when it's almost a guarantee this year that nobody's gonna step in behind you but your colleagues on your campus, whether it's your, your LRT people, your department colleagues, your grade level, whoever. Um, and our team still found ways to make it work, whether, it, you know, even on the day of, we didn't have our whole team there, but just it didn't work. I mean, bargaining 
the third to last day of school is not good for any teaching schedule. Um, but the team members that, that um, were there virtually or on the phone with us or there in the room were all just as much contributors to the success we had along this whole journey. Um, and then <clears throat> finally, just because I'm that guy, I do want to acknowledge that Rick is wearing a Whitney shirt tonight. Um, so we appreciate that. It's a good night for Whitney. We get, we're excited to have Scott joining us there. And then obviously all the, the work that comes with this, this agreement. So yeah, again, good, good new forging forward. And uh, it's on us, like we, we talked about in Labor Group, it's on us to make this what we need and want it to continue to be. And, and we'll own that as, as much as district and, and board and stakeholders across the, the community um, you know, will allow and enable us to do it. It's, it's our responsibility to keep this going forward. So. I probably took more time than I was supposed to as well. So oh, you're good. I'm gonna let Emily off the hook tonight. She's just gonna. She's just, just gonna stand and smile uh, and look yeah. beautiful. That's, okay. Yeah. So. All right. Yeah. Well, I so. will just say thank you, thank you, Emily. I know this is not your full time gig, and I know I can just imagine how many hours you spent on a very. I, I, I'm sure you feel like you could, right? Yeah. Well, thank you um, to everybody. I've already said this. Um, privately, I guess, in our smaller labor management group when it happened to be the day we were literally celebrating in my backyard with some Martinelli's. Um, and really, what a great thing to celebrate. And we, um, Trustee Hupp and I have seen a little bit of the progress, and it has been just amazing to watch, and we're excited for the future and really proud of the work that has been happening and appreciate your efforts, uh, both from the RTPA side and from the district, uh, all of us working together. So thank you. Shows. Mind if I say something? Yeah, go ahead. So I also want to just, uh, I, this is hands down, uh, I'm more excited about this than anything that's happened in my tenure uh, on the board. And um, it is a critical moment for Rockland, and I'm enormously proud of what you did and what you all did to make it happen. I think that it is a moment that was due, and also I think a lot of risks were taken and to land us where we are. I also, um, I'm excited about the contingency and the notion that we're sort of trusting each other going forward. I think if the legislature's version comes through, it could be a great bet for all of us, which would be awesome. Um, and um, I'm, but I'm equally, if not more, excited about the fair share, this idea that we're gonna have a framework to, to, to have this conversation every year. And to me, with all the hope that I have and all the excitement, I also do feel it's the beginning of a journey. We're not done. I think actually and arguably next year is even more important than this year. Can we retain this? Can we keep it going? Can we get another unanimous vote or close to it so people feel like we're on the right track and that they feel what I think is most exciting. I think you're right, Travis, if we're fair, there's a lot of money on the table, so it's easier to do when there's a lot of money on the table. But I think that we are in a place where folks felt both respected and co well compensated. And, and finding that balance where they always feel that way, they felt like they got what was reasonable, what, they, what we could do, and, uh, and there was respect there. And so making sure that we keep this moment, not, be, not spike the football, but continue down the road and make sure that we continue to work hard. And I think we got a great thing to do, and I just deeply appreciate everyone's work. Thank you. You know, I just want to take a second, not just to echo, but I do think it's important that all parties hear from the board. This, this is huge. This took a lot of work uh, from many, many people. And so I just want to take a moment just to say thank you to everybody. I know only two of us can actually sit on the labor management. Um, but as a newer trustee, there was really five main goals I had, and this was one of them, to find a more collaborative way to work together, to have more transparency and talk about things that may not be easy to talk about. Um, but at the end of the day to say, hey, we're in this together. So how, how, do we, how do we bear the burden of sometimes difficult financial times, but how do we also be generous and share when there's great financial times, right? And so I was so appreciative. I know there's been many conversations, not only just personally as a, a newer trustee, but uh, all of my colleagues on the board, I have heard from every single one. This is a goal. We wanna get towards a collaborative process where everybody feels heard, everybody feels respected. We're able to solve problems together. Uh, and I was very hopeful of a new fair share formulaic approach. Uh, and I actually think this is, this is something really to be celebrated. This isn't just a, hey, we did it, let's move on and go. Although I fully support a summer off. <laughs> um, and so I'm very appreciative, um, again, not only as a trustee, but also so as a parent, I just want to take a second for my, the teachers of my, my, that have taught my children 
You know, I'm thankful that they get to go home during the summer and not have this hanging over their head, not be stressing. And so I, I hope you really hear me when I say thank you. Thank you to all of our TPA, every single teacher. I've heard of the hours and hours and hours that you've taken to sit down with accounting. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to all of our district teams uh, that, you know, we said, hey, run the formula again. Let me see that again. Let me, that, that was hours and hours and hours, but thank you for that so we can walk through this process together. So again, I just wanted to share my thanks, not only as a trustee, I know it was a goal of ours, uh, but really I mean it when I say as a parent, thank you. Can I just add one thing? So obviously we're really excited about the financial piece, but there are some articles on language, great stuff that, so I know that'll be presented with the, the formalities of, at the next meeting, but I encourage I'm sure you guys have by now, but the public that's listening, but to look at that, there are some excellent examples of collaboration on language around our universal TK, K programs, big areas that are never easy around special education, you know, so things that like, this wasn't all about money. Mm -hmm. That was the, that's the headline thing always, but like, it's it, just a great example of it works in all the avenues. And you know, and Rick, I know we talked about this a long time ago that like we thought the language would be the easy part and the money would be the hard part in the end it really was they were both easy when we at least agreed to disagree or understood what each side so again that just encourage people to look at that because there's some great work and evidence of that work and and just language it has nothing to do with the financials and, and all the other stuff too so now, thank you. And, and, and if I can j just okay. add before we leave this item, I just want to extend my my thanks too as well uh, to both uh, Travis Emily, their teams, and, and of course our, our teams as well. Everyone that worked at this. And what makes me most excited isn't just the agreement in, in summer because we are absolutely all thrilled to not have this uh, <laughs> for any of us as we start the year, um, but is the fact that we have structures and systems that we're beginning to build to sustain this. Uh, work and momentum, and I, I think the versus we just got lucky because there was a great budget, but that how do we continue that dialogue and partnership? And, and I think this really provides all of us a way to further collaborate in more and more areas. And even uh, I'm excited about the future of even more of this at our schools with, with colleagues there, and, and I just am grateful for everyone willing to take risks and am and, and, and thrilled and congratulations on a unanimous ratification. Uh, those are rare if, if I've ever heard one. And so that's, that's really, I think, speaks to the trust too that um, your members have in your, your leadership. And, and I think you, know, you all should be congratulated for that level of trust in your members. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great summer. Thank you. All right, we'll move now to employee organization report. Welcome CSEA President Chuck Haddox to present the CSEA report. Thank How's you, it President going? Price, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Stock. I didn't bring my eyeballs today, so I'm a, I want to be squinting a little bit. So we've been working very hard on opening up our successor agreement between RUSD and the CSCA for the 2022-2025 year. Our, t our chapter is having a special meeting on Zoom at 4 p.m. this Friday at 10, or, or this Friday the 10th to approve our articles to open. It is my understanding that the board is willing to hold a special board meeting on June 14th um, to get our successor agreement on the calendar. So with that, I want to say thank you to all of the members of the board, Roger Stock, Tony Limoge, Matt Murphy, all you guys have been working really hard, and everyone else involved in making it happen for the benefit of all the classified members. <clears throat> so thank you to each and every one of you and looking forward to June 14. All right. That's all I have for you. Fantastic, us too. Okay. You have a great summer too. I think we'll see you between now and then. Well, we, we, if we don't, <laughs> all of us don't get the summer off, but we're gonna make sure that you guys all come back to clean classrooms and everything. Fantastic, so. we appreciate that. Thank nice you so floors, much. everything. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, item 8.1. Uh, all matters listed under the consent calendar are to be considered routine and will be enacted by one motion followed by a roll call vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless the Board of Trustees, audience, or staff request specific items to be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action. Any items removed will be voted upon following the motion to approve the consent calendar. Does anyone wish to remove an item from the consent agenda for separate discussion and action? Okay, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items? So moved. First by Julie, is there a second? second. 
Second by Tiffany. Brenda, will you please call the roll? Rick Miller? Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. Tiffany Sadoff? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Now to item 9.1, hold a public hearing for the 2022-23 district budget and annual certification for workers' compensation claims. Barbara Patterson, Deputy Superintendent Business and Operations. Do they close the hearing after the presentation? Yes, uh, the, the staff will make the presentation to the board, and then based on that information, uh, the, the board will uh, typically open a public hearing. Okay. 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 Good evening, President Price, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Stock. Barbara, ready to go? Yes. I apologize. I missed item 7.1. And now that you're all ready, would you mind if we take just one more minute and see if anybody has any board comments? I'm so sorry. It's totally my fault. Okay. Do any of my colleagues have some board comments? Yeah. Tiffany, you're up. <laughs> Tell me we did not go back on the agenda just did. for me. <laughs> we did. We just want to hear what you have to say. Well, I'll do a super quick update um, for my colleagues. Um, just the, a couple weekends ago, we had the CSBA Delegate Assembly, um, and so that was great. That was for trustees that were elected to the Delegate Assembly throughout the state, um, and so to bring our voice uh, for our region to the state. Um, and I will tell you, it was a phenomenal experience. It was so great getting to talk with trustees throughout the state. Um, and even though many of our areas varied in some of our needs, uh, there were some striking areas that throughout the state there were concerns. Um, and so by the end of the assembly, I just wanted to report back. Um, there were really three main, there were many areas, but three main areas that there seemed to be a commonality um, that CSBA with um, trustees from throughout the state are encouraging, requesting help from the state with. And one is really fully funding our special education programs. Um, that was something that we heard across the board um, and we are hearing support from our legislators on. Um, additionally, fully funding transportation. Uh, the home to school bill um, and so there was um, much consensus there asking for support and help there um, and then a lot of conversation about a full return to local decision making um, and that that may look different for every district um, but what does that look like and how does that happen and how do we do that when our districts are very different from one another and might have different needs from each other and so it was just a really beneficial beneficial time to represent not only Rockland um, but really our region um, and we got some great reports uh, back on some of the bills that are at play right now our funding um, mechanisms that are at play and so this year is looking like a great year um, but I know we never know what the future has to hold um, but I just want to share uh, with our board on that and then also graduations I'm sure we all maybe have comments on that um, but I just thought it was it's always a special time of year to be able to celebrate and look literally out into the field of why we do what we do we're graduating incredible world changers uh, that are going out there so as those students walked across the stage I know that was sweet um, but I wanted to share one thing from Springview really quickly that I thought was incredibly special, um, and I hope the teachers are listening in um, from Springview. Uh, there was actually a really sweet moment where a student's name was called uh, for him to receive his promotion certificate, and he saw his teacher that was standing off to the side. He completely bypassed his promotion certificate, ran completely to his teacher, tears in his eyes, and gave her a giant hug. And I think they gave a hug for a good 30 seconds, what felt like maybe five minutes. Um, I will tell you, it actually got me teary-eyed because the whole audience uh, did an awe and then started clapping. And I thought that just showed the special bond our students have with their teachers. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure to highlight that because I thought that was a really sweet and planned moment in the middle of a ceremony of hundreds of kids getting recognized. But yet that student really showed 
uh, how, what a difference his teacher made in his life this last year. So I just want to say a thank you to teachers as they head out uh, for summer. A huge thank you to all of our CSEA teams that are staying and helping during the summer, um, but also just to my colleagues. I thank you. Uh, I think it's because of the great work we're able to do together and Roger, Superintendent Stock, um, an appreciation to you. Those students, when they graduate, I know you read out it's the board, but it's under your leadership that every one of them completed uh, what they completed. So just to thank you. I agree. Graduation week was awesome. It was so fun and it's so inspiring to hear, especially those students that give their speeches and, and where they're headed and what they're doing, what they've taken from Rockland, and hopefully they come back and, and contribute to our community in meaningful ways. It was, it, was, it was a really, really great week. Superintendent Stock, do you have any comments? To acknowledge that we start summer school and our extended school year for our students with special needs, that I have that in their individual education plan next week. So we want to really thank all of the uh, educators and some of our administrators and others and of course our classified staff who never leave for just uh, continuing to let students learn and serve them uh, throughout the summer because for many of them there there is no summer off <laughs> and so we're excited about that and again to thank the principals and all those involved at the graduations for just truly honoring our students in such a special way and and I think again acknowledging that we had one of our, our trustees and who had a graduate um, and that was great to see who also served as a student trustee this year. Barbara, we're ready for you for reels this time. Thank you. I am sorry. I know this looks like a long list, but it, it really will go quickly. <laughs> um, um, but I am going to touch on every one of these topics tonight. Uh, we'll start with our budget reporting cycle. Um, tonight we'll, we'll have the budget presentation as well as the LCAP presentation um, and the public hearings. And then our final um, act in the budget cycle uh, this year will be to um, for the board to approve um, and adopt the budget on hopefully on January 22nd and the LCAP plan. Um, there, there are a lot of differences between the legislature's budget proposal. The uh, State Assembly and Senate announced on um, June 1st that they had come to an agreement of, on a plan for the adopted budget, but it had several changes and differences in funding um, for from the May revise, which is what we based our budget on. And I just listed a couple items here. I didn't go through and do a um, multi-page of here's the legislature and here's the governor, because we'll find out what they decide and bring that all back to you and what it means. Uh, but there are some differences in ongoing versus one-time funding. Um, some of the things that they're talking about really won't impact Rockland um, directly, but uh, the, the funding level for the expanded learning opportunity, um, that could be significant. The one-time discretionary block grant, the funding level, and if there are strings attached or not, that could be significant for uh, the district. One-time deferred maintenance funding, legislature took it out. It's in the governor's proposal. and. As we all know, we would love to have more deferred maintenance funding, so um, that's, that's um, up for um, negotiation. And then one time school kitchen facilities funding, uh, the legislature is wanting to put more money into that. Um, so we, we shall stay tuned, and um, we will obviously be bringing back um, what the final state adopted budget means to Rockland to you in the August uh, board meeting. So uh, just a summary, starting with the summary level, um, the budget was based on the latest information and on the governor's uh, May revise for the most part. And um, starting with the, the, uh, um, the LCAP plan for our, um, our supplemental uh, student programs, um, we included the increases for um, insurance and utilities and cost of living, our annual step and 
income increases, pension rate increases are required, uh, routine restricted maintenance contribution. We had a lot of one-time money, that, uh, revenues and expenditures that were uh, ending. Um, we still have some um, moving forward, and we have a slide for you uh, later on about that. And then the exciting opening of Quarry Trail Elementary is included. Uh, the, the funding on the COLA and a couple of our um, categorical programs um, is 6.56%, uh, and then we included in our budget assumptions the uh, governor's proposal to adjust the base funding for the local control funding formula, which equated about 3.3%. Um, and we also included his proposals to allow us to use a three-year uh, average of prior three-year ADA and apply uh, 1920 uh, attendance yield to our 21-22 enrollment uh, to get a higher ADA funding through our LCFF uh, funding formula. So we're really hoping that that all plays through and is in the final um, version of the state adopted budget because that really, those two items really did help us in our funding for 22-23 and 23-24. Um, with all of those pieces and adjustments and COLA um, to the local control funding formula, there's, even though our ADA that we're, re we're getting funded on is about uh, 242, I think, uh, less, after going through all those calculations, we're still looking at uh, $9 million new revenue in that, that funding formula. And 274,000 of that is an additional money to be spent only for um, those supplemental, um, uh, the supplemental programs and students. The lottery uh, funding is projected to be the, the same rate, but it is based on ADA. And all of those adjustments the governor is proposing for LCFF do not apply to lottery. So that's gonna be based on our actual ADA. Um, mandated costs got the 6.56% COLA uh, we budgeted uh, vacancy savings, so we start with every position is full for the whole year, and um, but we're estimating savings due to turnover and um, vacancies during that time before you, you fill another position of a, a little over 400,000. We didn't, uh, there were no changes to staffing levels other than um, the add-on for uh, reducing TK stat, uh, classroom ratios, so that's an add-on to the um, local control funding formula, and that is to fund, specifically fund uh, staffing those classrooms with the teacher and an instructional aid. So we built in six-hour instructional aids to bring those class staffing ratios down to 12 to one, and that's a requirement under the uh, universal pre-K expansion program that the governor has proposed. Step and column, um, net of retirement is included. That was um, a little over $900,000. And our pension costs, um, as you can see, both PERS and STRS rates went up again this year. And uh, that was the um, increase in the budget just for the rate increases, excluding all of the uh, changes in, in um, salaries and people retiring and such is a, a $2 million increase over um, our estimated actuals. Technology, we budgeted 100,000. Um, that was previously 800,000, but the, um, also budgeted to maximize our matching for the E-rate um, technology equipment that we could match 50%. So uh, the programs uh, for switches and wireless uh, projects we have budgeted uh, 781000 so the projects cost double that. Um, so we'll be having those um, come through in 22-23. And then because of the increase in expenditures, the transfer of 3% of total expenditures increased by $379,000 to routine restricted maintenance. Um, what else did I have on here? Utilities. Uh, especially PG&E is going up significantly, we're told, and then we also added a whole year of utilities for a quarry trail. 
So um, those costs went up about 8%. Our property liability and in cyber insurance, those have been uh, finalized later and later um, the last three years. And so um, our S school's insurance group full board is meeting uh, next week. Hopefully we'll have the final rates for those. We built in a 15% increase, um, but I know they're still finalizing the cyber insurance. They're getting very particular and we may be having to come back to the board with additional costs for requirements uh, to protect ourselves against cyber um, um, attacks so that we can maintain our insurance. Okay. Uh, textbooks, the adoption for world language and the remaining science um, textbook adoption, which is I believe K5 and 912 are included in this uh, budget for 22-23. Special education, our contribution to this program is going up uh, $1.5 million. The total costs are um, over three point, about 3.5 million, but we are getting uh, the COLA and the base increase on our AB 602 funding, so the net increase um, in our contribution is about $1.5 million for our special education programs. The next two slides show all the changes that we are um, seeing in staffing adjustments. We kind of broke them down between our certificated uh, staff on the first page and classified on the second. And then you can see uh, one-time funding or categorically funded. Categorically funded could be a Title I, for example. Um, are listed separately from our typical staffing ratios that we staff our, our, our schools and, um, and uh, our classrooms. So um, we're, we're adding a, a little over five and a half in with one time or categorically funded positions and certificated and a net of 2.78 um, in our staffing ratios. Overall, we reduced our um, Gen Ed teacher K-12 uh, staffing by seven, just based on our enrollment. Um, so that's a total of uh, 8.33 increase in certificated staff. Um, are there any questions on that one? And then we have our classified staff. Again, um, you'll see here the in the middle of the page a big a big negative number the instructional aid short term. That was through the one-time funding of our learning recovery plan. And um, as we're looking at the funding, the plan that was brought back to the board um, earlier this year did not include um, instructional aids, but um, those can be built into the 45-day uh, revision um, when, we, when we come back in August. Where where were they funded out of? Those were funded mostly out of the ELO um, state and federal funding um, so that we, we received. Can we capture that same funding stream to fund? So there were, the state also named two programs the same thing, but they're different. So there's this is not extended learning, obviously, right? Yes. Exactly. Right. So there's, yeah, just love them. Right. Uh, extended learning opportunities grant right. was one time money that was, they cobbled together state and federal, they kind of changed it. Right. That was one time, and we spent almost all of that. And um, then they have the expanded learning opportunity program, which is ongoing, which is that longer day and, 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 and during the summer program. So not to get those. And computers. that's where it, it was that extended day that we used to fund instructional aids for intervention. Yes, the one time. Okay. And so this year, the one time pro, um, the learning 2.0, as we we're calling it, yeah. um, is uh, a smaller plan, but that is being funded out of several different uh, programs. But ongoing funding streams, or is it a mix? Some are ongoing okay. and some are are one time. Some are finishing up, um, like the ESSER three, and educator effectiveness, yep. and A through G grant. We've got we put a lot of pieces, and then the the uh, five hundred thousand of general fund that was put to uh, put to this pr this uh, plan. Yeah. 
So. Okay. And, and we're you. looking as we look at the, you know, because some of these funds and expenditure areas had some, not all the money that's budgeted always gets spent. For example, you couldn't find an aide or a teacher to hire in a position, or you planned for training and you didn't get the substitutes to release. So as we looked at all these different pieces, we think that we'll be able to um, reallocate a couple hundred thousand dollars to support aids in, in some of the learning recovery programs. So that's the recommendation we worked with our educational services partners to look at. You know, part of this is we, we fully funded everything everywhere. And so as we move into uh, sustainability, we are, we are looking at different models. So we're going to look at having some of these aids back through, the, through that reallocation piece. Um, and so we'll be excited to have some of those in there. And then we, the board did commit a million dollars out of ongoing uh, general fund revenue to support learning recovery, which is, is, again, less than we have going in this year. But we're looking at sustainability and best practices. And for example, at Quarry Trail, they're going to be experimenting in our continuous improvement model with kind of a PDSA on a different type of le learning recovery format that see if we can more efficiently serve students with a little bit less resources. So. Um, so there will be some instructional aids back through as we mitigate, and that'll show up in the budget in August when you do the revision piece. Other pieces, uh, um, other staffing that you'll see in here are, you know, staffing for our front office and custodial for um, our new elementary school, Corey Trail. Um, we have already hired the principal and the coordinator for the, <clears throat> excuse me, the dual language program. So those um, are not new. Um, but we do have um, the other uh, support positions added here as well. So for total changes, um, as you can see, we spent a lot of one-time money, and those are going away. So a decrease of almost 21 in one-time or categorically funded positions, and then an increase of about 30 in our um, staffing ratios and adjustments. So for a net of nine and a half. We still have one-time funding um, that we are spending on, on in, in, and have budgeted and adopted. Uh, we have, we're projected to have uh, one last um, federal program, which we refer to as ESSER 3. So ESSER 1, ESSER 2, GEAR, those are all going to be done at the end of this year. And so we'll have this um, funding uh, going through into 22, 23. And then all of these other um, grants that are listed here um, are state. I also listed the supplemental carryover. We had a little bit larger than normal supplemental carryover. As we all know, we spent our most restricted resources first, and so we've budgeted to uh, spend that supplemental carryover in the, the um, LCAP plan for 22-23. Total that we budgeted in our one-time funding of expenditures is $4.7 million. Um, in all of these programs combined. Uh, last year at this time, we had pages of <laughs> one-time uh, programs, and luckily we don't this year. Um, the two that we have included, as I, I talked to you about earlier about staffing ratios, is um, the uh, universal pre-K expansion. So. As you remember, they're um, moving the birth date to February 1st. You have to be age five by February 1st instead of December 1st. Um, and they've rebenched Prop 98 funding for us, luckily, um, to pay for those students. And then also the um, add-on to the LCFF uh, funding for reducing our staffing ratio to 12 to 1. And then um, in the cafeteria fund, you had a presentation from uh, the director, Charles uh, Douglas, about continuing the free meals into next year. It's just a different funding. Instead of federal funding, it's state funding. Um, so those are the two, I would call, new programs that we have in our budget um, for adopted. And so what's not included in uh, this adopted budget before you is the one-time discre discretionary block grant. Um, We'll be bringing that back to you um, in the fall with a proposed plan for uh, you to discuss and decide on how to spend that money. Again, the governor is saying it's unrestricted money that the local board can decide to spend it on whatever you choose. And the legislature is wanting to tie it to personnel costs. 
So we'll see how that shakes out. Um, the governor has proposed increased ELOP funding. We built it in at the same level that we received this year. So if that goes through, we will we bring an increase in the um, uh, ELOP funding. And then um, there's a proposal to add infrastructure funds for that program that we don't have an estimate of what that would be for us, and so we'll, we would wait until we get something from the state telling us what that kind of that allocation might be. And deferred maintenance um, is in the governor's may revise again um, how that will be um, allocated, and if it will be in the final budget, we'll, we'll wait until then as well. And as I told you previously, we based it on the governor's may revise as which we, we we always do, and so. The legislature's, legislature's um, plan um, has not been included in our budget. Uh, just a reminder on our enrollment, I think we're looking good. Um, we're 241 students from um, where we are now enrolled for next year to our budget, and um, so based on the last couple of years, and I think I think it was like 49 students enrolled in the last week, so we're really excited about that. So we, we think we're gonna hit our target and hopefully exceed it, but um, our enrollment is looking good. <laughs> so um, the reserve cap, this is a cap on districts um, reserves, our fund balance, our savings accounts. And so um, Senate Bill 751 set the thresholds for triggering the reserve cap. And on March 17th, the um, State Superintendent of Public Instruction issued a notification that it's going to apply for our 2022-23 fiscal year. So there, it uh, only applies to assigned and unassigned combined of our fund balance. So our um, legally restricted uh, fund balance is not included in the calculation and committed is not included in the calculation. Um, so it's just our assigned and unassigned fund balance. So options to districts to be able to comply with staying below the 10% cap are committing to specific expenditures, committing your uh, portion of your fund balance to, com to um, specific expenditures uh, or contributing to res other restricted programs like routine restricted maintenance or special ed or transferring to other funds or asking the county office for an exemption and you can get an exemption um, for two years within a three-year period but they're projecting that this cap is going to be in existence for a very long time so they warned you know don't use your your waiver card until you <laughs> really have to. So what we've put together is um, a list of items for the board to consider to commit in fund balance, and um, I can walk you through those. So the proposed cost or the estimated cost for the settlement for all employees um, that is based on um, the tentative agreement with RTPA. And then that impact on, if your expenditures increase, you have to then uh, contribute 3% of those increased expenditures to routine restricted maintenance. So the total cost is estimated right now to be $6,180,000. So once we bring the AB 1200 and we, um, we calculate those exact costs, we would put those in the budget for 22-23. And, but because of the timing difference of developing our adopted budget, we, have, we are um, saying we want to commit those funds. So the board is going to spend those monies for employee um, compensation. So we're committing the 6.18 um, million in 22-23. And these are ongoing costs. And so until we put them in expenditures, 
up in our expenditure budget and show the actual dollars being spent, it's going to accumulate in our, in our reserve each of the three years of the multi-year. So if you think about it, in year three, 24, 25, we'll have spent $6.1 million in 22, 23, $6.1 million in 23, 24, and $6.1 million in 24, 25. So in those three years, we'll be spending $18 million. And so as you're looking at your multi-year fund balance, because those expenditures aren't showing up above, it, the um, money is dropping to the bottom line in fund balance. So we're committing those dollars, showing we're going to spend them. And so once all of the settlements come through and we bring you back and adopt uh, a revised budget with those settlements in them, we're committing those dollars in our fund balance. Um, we also have uh, committed textbook adoption and instructional materials. We do have some um, consumable materials that, that are spent uh, or replenished each year. And then we have some uh, adoptions. We've got an ELA textbook adoption and an out year. Um, and to fund our instructional material budget um, in our multi-year projection, we do have contributions from the general fund because um, for our adoptions and the increased cost in our um, software, we will be um, using unrestricted general fund dollars to, to fund our instructional materials budget. So that is, because those are typically one time in nature, um, you don't see those accumulating. And the ELA adoption is out in the, um, out in a, uh, a further year in the uh, MYP projections. The carryover and unspent school site discretionary, um, and except for when we were making budget reductions, the policy was if the site didn't spend their money, they would get a carryover. We'd close the books and then we'd give them the carryover so they could spend that on their school site. And so this is just a continuation of the student fee funds and the um, site donations and the site discretionary. So we're estimating 300,000 dropping to the bottom uh, line in 21-22. So we're just saying we're committing those funds to be reallocated to the sites in 22-23. Learning recovery program, um, Superintendent Stock spoke about that um, allocation um, earlier. And so we're showing um, spending of those funds in each year and spending it down. Um, so over those three years, it's $3 million. And so since, so that's why it's going from 3 million to 2 million to 1 million. Um, so then we would have to come back to the board to say, are those going to be ongoing unrestricted expenditures? The uh, technology infrastructure, um, Again, that's $500,000 per year, and we just built in three years of expenditures there. Um, the mental health programs, the supplemental, I'm not sure what happened there. The mental health was $300,000 a year, so we've got three years of that. And then the deficit spending mitigation, once we um, have all of our settlement costs for 22, 23 built into the budget, those are the um, unrestricted deficit spending amounts in our adopted budget. So we have those there. Um, if you recall, in previous budgets, we would assign fund balance for the future year, subsequent year deficit spending. It's kind of just like moving those into committed. And then declining enrollment mitigation, that was based on looking at what we're going to be funded on each year, what ADA we're going to be funded on each year, and as it's going down each year, the calculation of the decrease in the ADA we're funded on by the average ADA amount in our local control funding formula is included here. So those all have a subtotal. And then I just wanted to remind you that um, previous boards have committed to 
um, the cell tower revenue and facilities use. So whenever there's an organization that comes and uses our facilities, we charge fees. Those uh, fees that are um, after we pay for our utilities and our custodials and such, those all go into these committed accounts so that they can then be spent on repairing the facilities and keeping the fields and the um, theaters, um, the track, and um, we're spending some of that money on to help uh, replace the Rockland High School track and, and field this summer. So that's what those are, and, um, and so we continue to commit those revenues for those purposes. So these total numbers you'll see in the multi-year for these three years um, of the 19.3, the 25.7, and the 30 million in our um, components of fund balance. So looking at our multi-year projection, this is combined, um, restricted and unrestricted. And so as we've um, talked about our estimated actuals, we've been spending um, our one-time money. Um, and so we're not required to commit and meet that 10% uh, cap in 21-22. So that's why you'll see, if you look at line little a uh, three in committed, you'll see those, those three numbers from the previous page and how those have moved. So um, this is our multi-year of our adopted budget. We're showing that um, our fund balance is below 10% for um, assigned and unassigned um, for the three budget years, 22, 23, 23, 24, and 24, 25. The deficit spending that you're seeing here in 22, 23 is spending down uh, one-time funding. Currently, we don't have a deficit spending until we um, book uh, our settlement costs in unrestricted, that is restricted. So changes, opportunities, and risks. We spoke about building the budget on the May revise, on decisions that have already been made by the board, on um, industry standard economic assumptions, and locally calculated data points. Uh, so for example, we'll take the last three years of our uh, rental fees and that's how we'll estimate our, our rental fees for the future year. So the main um, areas where the budget can fluctuate and our assumptions can change are the um, local control funding formula, whether it's the ADA or enrollment that we get to be funded on, um, or the loss mitigation rules, what, how those shake out in adopted budget, and then the existing state uh, program funding changes what that might look like, and if there are new state programs, um, if the legislature adds some new state programs. Special education funding and cost, um, you know, our, our charge, otherwise known as their bill back for our services for our students that attend PCOE programs, um, and our cost for our programs, and our enrollment. Um, and then we have staffing, and vacancy savings and hiring costs and savings. So those are areas that can fluctuate in our adopted budget assumptions. And then risks to the budget um, in a more global sense are um, the economy, the inflation, and, uh, and fears about the prolonged inflation, supply chain bottlenecks, we are still dealing with those. Um, our our CTO was telling me this week that we may be waiting up to a year for those switches that we're ordering. So um, that is still um, exacerbating our, our, um, our purchasing. Uh, the volatility of the stock market, as you know, California really relies on capital gains for our revenues, which funds our education, uh, Prop 98. And then the um, Ukraine-Russian war, um, how that will impact us, and if we have another surge in, in COVID. So, last slide. Next steps. 
adopting the uh, LCAP and the budget for 2023 at the next board meeting on the 22nd. Um, and the state budget is expected to be adopted on time in June. And then we have to submit our, our um, SACS report and our budget to the county office for approval. And then I, I believe the material changes, the changes um, for the state adopted budget will probably be material. So I think we'll be bringing back um, a budget revision in the August meeting. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Barbara. Anybody have any questions? I don't have a question just to say I really appreciate this. And I would say, like, I don't know what to say about the committed fund balance. I, I appreciate the way you've dealt with it. And I think you've come up with a, a good solution to a silly problem created by the state. And so um, this seems like a good direction going forward for us um, and sets us up actually for long-term sustainability in a way that's going to be very helpful and to be able to continue to have a fair share agreement with our with our way that we agree to locally. So I appreciate it. Anybody else? Okay. I now open the public hearing for the 2022-23 district budget and annual certification for workers' compensation claims. Are there any public comments? I now close the public hearing. Thank you. All right, now to item 9.2. We're also going to have a public hearing for our USD 2022-23 Local Control and Accountability Plan. Hannah Anderson, Director, Innovation School Programs and Accountability. Welcome. Good evening, President Price, trustees, Superintendent Stock. I am here tonight to present to you our 2022-2023 Local Control and Accountability Plan and ask for a public hearing. During this presentation, I will share an uh, overview of the educational partner input received and the overarching themes we heard through um, our input gathering. We'll also review at a high level our 2022-23 LCAP, including a budget summary, a review of our annual update, information about our local indicators, our actions and services for the coming year, and specifically increased and improved services for our unduplicated students. As a reminder, those are our socioeconomically disadvantaged students, including our students living in homelessness, our foster youth, and our English learner students. And at the end, we will discuss next steps. Our USD continues to prioritize engaging our educational partners. In May, trustees heard information aligned to each goal area of the LCAP, specifically the input we heard from our educational partners, our parents, our students, our staff and teachers and administrators, uh, aligned to each goal area. Um, as you heard, uh, we have gathered input from all of these groups um, in many different ways over the past year, and I would um, venture to say this has really been a culmination of a three-year <laughs> LCAP journey because of the disruption um, presented by COVID-19. So we have taken in information that was pre-pandemic as well as during the pandemic and forecasting what we'll see um, as we, as we hope to move beyond the pandemic. Um, so we have uh, gathered information in the form of surveys as well um, as hearing from our students in student forums and panels. This year we included uh, our math steering committee and professional development committees and their input was invaluable into the refresh process of, uh, of our LCAP. It was wonderful to be able to hear directly from practitioners who are doing the work aligned to these areas and make sure that their input um, was equal um, in, uh, in crafting what they wanted to see as next steps. We also continued with our staff advisory committees, including our labor partners, our parent uh, guardian advisory committees, and our district leadership teams uh, gave input along of this refresh process, and then hearing specifically from groups representing our unduplicated students. So hearing from our, uh, he hearing from our parents of English learners through our district English learner advisory committee and, uh, and school site councils at each school ELAC meetings. We also um, have a foster and homeless youth advisory committee that has uh, parents and um, 
and our local partners at Placer County Office of Education, our experts in, th in that area, sit with us and help us think about uh, the planning that we need to do for these student groups. We've had a consultation with the SELPA, and we've heard from trustees um, along the way. Our overarching themes for the 22-23 school year are continued uh, from what we saw um, in the creation of the three-year plan. So in this refresh, remember we're just actually refreshing a three-year plan and we're approving um, at the end of this month, hopefully, uh, the, the next year's version of this. So the overarching themes continued and there was shifts uh, in two areas uh, mainly. So actually three. So in math achievement, we shifted to now be um, trialing change ideas, and you'll hear about the work um, in uh, Director Davidson's presentation coming up next. Uh, in the area of social emotional supports and services, you actually heard a, uh, educational partners sharing that they wanted to see more integration, especially at the elementary and middle school level, integration of those social emotional supports and the behavioral supports. And so one change that uh, is in the this year's version uh, refresh is the shift to having a standardized referral process for services to make sure that um, families know how to access services, staff know what the services are and how to engage students with those services, and um, last but certainly not least, that students know what the services are that are available to them and they know how to advocate and ask for those services. But that it isn't just about asking for the services, it's also about having a universal process of identifying who's in the greatest need of those services and who needs those services at school school because they may not have the same advantages to uh, access those services outside of school. The other main shift, and it was the, uh, the through line of the communication, that, or sorry, the, of the input that we heard this year, was the increased need for communication with all of those groups around uh, the interventions that were available and extensions that are available uh, in the area of math and English language arts specifically. And then in goal two, there was a request from families to truly understand more of what those services are, and then, uh, and that what also yielded that change to having that referral process. And we are ad adjusting to that by ensuring that our team here at the district office is providing school sites communication tools that can help standardize what, you know, so we have the same supports available at all of our elementary schools. It shouldn't be up to 12 elementary schools to communicate what is available to families. So we can be in service of our schools to make sure that we provide those communication tools for them. We anticipate revenues, as you just heard Barbara share, we anticipate revenues for supplemental um, LCFF uh, budget being at 4.5 million, or just a little above 4.5 million. We do anticipate, as I shared, um, or I gave a preview of at the mid-year update, at February LCAP mid-year update, that we were going to have a significant uh, carryover. This is uh, intended to be a one-time carryover of supplemental funds, knowing that we wanted to expend our one-time COVID funds first, and know that these supplemental funds have a longer period of being able to uh, carry them over into future years than some of the original uh, dates presented by many of the COVID funds. Initially, the, the dates for spending, actually some of them had only a one year, you must spend it within this time frame. Now, some of those shifted over time, but after we approved our plans. So in this case, we're saying we wanted to spend those one-time funds first, and you will see all uh, $868,000 is budgeted to increase or improve services within our LCAP next year. So the budgeted uh, expenditures within the LCAP are uh, just over 5.4 million of supplemental funds specifically. And that also is a shift uh, in the law that we actually need to budget for our uh, LCAP. It has been past practice in Rockland Unified um, uh, and has not, uh, we've not used that the last couple of years, but prior to we were budgeting uh, supplemental carryover. We are now going to be budgeting supplemental carryover ongoing, um, and we will budget 
what we see at estimated actuals as being what we project to carry over, and we will budget all of those funds in the coming year. So you can see a, a little over a million dollars of supplemental funds alone being targeted towards goal one, math improvement. And these are just supplemental funds. If you look deeper in the LCAP, you'll see um, we, we include all but $14 million of our total RUSD budget in the LCAP. So you will see goal one has a much higher uh, number in the expenditures table of what we anticipate spending, but just of that $5.4 million supplemental funds to target towards those unduplicated students, um, a million of them will go towards math improvement. And just, I'm pretty sure I would know this, but when we carry over supplemental funds, it's protected within supplemental. Correct. And it also increases our, uh, what we need to increase and improve services by. By that amount. Mm -hmm. And so when you said, I didn't really, so the law change was around having to identify your carryover funds? So it's interesting because it's all based on estimated actuals. Right. So the law says that what we said we were going to spend in the LCAP last year, based on what we actually did end up spending of supplemental funds. So it doesn't necessarily... The difference is they consider it carryover regardless. They consider the carryover. However, we may be allocated more supplemental right. dollars once, uh, once the legislature passes the budget, but that is not the dollar amount that is included in the LCAP. So you kind of look at a LCAP carryover versus an actual LCFF supplemental carryover. Okay, but there's no ultimate, other than the fact that it has to say, stay supplemental, there's no restrictions to those dollars. Once it hits that next year budget, it all comes into one spendable dollars as long as it's spent on those kids. Correct. Okay. For uh, social, emotional, well-being and behavioral supports within goal two, we anticipate spending just over 1.1 million. And in goal three, which is our maintaining um, and enhancing existing programs, which uh, we anticipate spending supplemental um, just over 3.2 million, uh, a, a little over 1 million of which, and you'll see this on a future slide, is uh, directed towards our English learner students. Other funding sources, as I shared a few minutes ago, we include everything but $14 million of our total budget in Rockland Unified, we try to, or we strive for transparency to align all of our dollars to each of our LCAP actions so we can see how this plan is really driving all of the work we do in Rockland Unified. And so other funding sources that are supported with LCAP actions are the inclusion of our LCFF base funds, uh, state and federal categorical programs, including um, new categorical programs such as educator effectiveness is in there, all of our federal title programs, um, CTE programs, and then the remainder of our one-time state and federal COVID funds. There was also a legislative change two years ago to include the local indicators alongside the, um, alongside the presentation of the LCAP. I'm sorry, can I go back? Out of curiosity, when you, so I appreciate that we're, which is what we should be doing, including other funding sources, because it doesn't really matter where it's generated, it's how much you have. When, when you sit with our outside groups, do you, what budget dollars, do, do you put the full amount on, or do you just put LCFF dollars on? So what we do is we try to put all, we definitely put all of the supplemental funds. Right. And then we specifically put a line to goals one and goal two as many of the other funds as we know at the time. So like as an example, if you're talking about our OSCA, you're talking about our kids in poverty, do, 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 you, do you, at the same time you're talking to parents, include Title I dollars in that and look at the holistic of all we have to spend, or do you think of it separately when we present? I don't think we think of it separately, but we don't spend as much time Thinking specifically about talking about the dollars yeah. as we do talking about the services and supports yeah. for students okay. and then we fill in the dollars behind yeah. that okay thanks okay so an additional shift uh, in uh, what the legislature requires um, requiring us to present the local indicators alongside the 
uh, alongside the LCAP each June. The dashboard is expected to be released in December of 2020. This year, we are anticipating that the California State Dashboard will be status only. In the past, we've seen status and change, and we'll, I will come back to trustees in the fall and share all about this. But uh, we, uh, that dashboard includes local indicators, and it includes five that are driven based on local information and rubrics provided by um, the state of California. So districts write their own narratives or use these state provided tools. Our indicators must be um, presented here and then uploaded to the dashboard in November. I have included them as attachment A um, for your review and um, provided a local indicator executive summary as well. And I actually had a question about the dashboard data. Would you like me to ask it at the end, or is it okay to interrupt you right now while you're there? You used to okay. agree to <laughs> Great. Because um, my question, actually, I was incredibly thankful for what you've highlighted on this report, because I know the attached document that we got, I think, 132 pages. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I appreciate the detail in our LCAP. Um, but... Something did catch my eye, and so I, I, I did want to point it out because I was a little concerned some of the dashboard areas that I was looking at. Specifically, I'm pulling from page 16 um, in that additional report, and where it talks about the gaps that we're seeing in some of our targeted students that are to receive this funding, right? The students that are generating the funding, we're seeing students, uh, specifically ELA, in an orange category where we have other students in green. Our suspension rate is in red for those students, but yet other students are in orange, and then our college career indicator is in orange and other students are in green. And so I get a little concerned when I see that, that we're seeing two levels of gap um, in those specific areas. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about how we're, how we're addressing that? And, and let, me, let me say, let me preface with my concern is, I know because we have a lower population of those students, it allows us the opportunity to use that funding district-wide. I see huge goals in that. Um, how do we make sure that funding specifically is meeting those three categories that did not do so well on our dashboard? Thank you for asking that. Okay. So when we have, um, when all of these goals and the actions actually were initially driven because or decided upon because we saw a gap that had a two level difference between how all students were performing and how um, students that you just identified were performing. And so when we see that, we need to address that in our LCAP. And we are actually keeping close eye uh, because anything that's in goal three, if it remains um, an area or we start to see it not improving, we would want to reconsider that being in a maintenance area of the LCAP and we might want to consider either adding a goal or changing an action to specifically address uh, a gap that persists um, more than one year. Right? So what I would uh, always urge us to do is not look at one year as a pattern Right, because one year can be uh, can can be influenced by many different factors. But if we start to see some some repeated uh, deficits, we would want to look at that together. Uh, to specifically answer your question, we do uh, in the area of English language arts, we are continuing to target our learning recovery programs and have made some adjustments to our learning recovery programs for the 22-23 school year to address this need and then have been, uh, have been identifying students that, uh, that are in that gap area and ensuring that those students have priority access. So I'm first gonna answer uh, what are the learning recovery courses and then I wanna share what that priority access change because uh, we have done a significant amount of work, Beth and her team have done a significant amount of work to change what that priority access looks like for the coming school year. So first is for learning recovery next year, we have the 12, um, we have the 12 in, uh, learning, or 11 now in the, the trial at Quarry Trail, but learning recovery teachers at elementary, and then at Springview Middle School where we see a, a target of those specific unduplicated students, we still have uh, half of a teacher that we fund through supplemental funds to provide English language arts interventions, and Springview Middle School uses their Title I funds to fund the other half of that teacher. So they will continue with a 1.0 learning recovery teacher in the area of English language arts, right? And then 
at high school, we will be targeting ninth and 10th graders, the need for um, providing learning recovery for students in ninth and 10th grade. And then for priority access, we have adjusted to ensuring that they, um, that we have identified four sites um, ahead of time. Each of, our, each of our secondary sites have received a spreadsheet. They have historically always gathered this information themselves. We tried to provide this information for them using our new data management tool um, and significant work um, by one of our program specialists. Um, thank you to Amanda Bannister. We, um, we're able to pri prioritize and say, here are all of the students who fell below this threshold on these particular assessments, and here are the students within those um, on this list who also have one who fall into one unduplicated um, student group. But maybe here's a student who's socioeconomic disadvantaged and an English learner student. Let's. So they can actually adjust the list and say, how are we prioritizing the enrollment for these students? And then Beth and her team have actually been meeting with the principals um, and the counselors of uh, each of the schools and working with them on what will priority access look like for these students. The next level then is they're scheduled. How do we ensure that they're scheduled and they attend, right? And they don't then get opted out or, um, or a schedule change happens and we, we may see a, you know, something may happen there. So that's the next level of work, but we, are, we have heard you and we are taking significant uh, changes to what that priority access looks like. It's not a strategy of hope. Thank you, it sounds like you are on top of it. I just wanna make sure those students get the, the money that they're, that they're getting for us, so thank you. Again, and I want you to, well, I just for the board, I wanna highlight the integration of the work of the teams. You can see across different areas and sectors coordinating our resources and then even with our sites of the deliberate change of here's the list of kids skip please work to schedule them and we're going to come back and ensure that occurred and if there was any anomalies how do we assist you in getting those kids in so that constant checking in the system to make sure these kids get the services intended because with all good intentions sometimes it just doesn't get there so we really want to not have anybody fall through the cracks if you will and try to set up systems and structures that, that don't allow that to occur um, and, and so while i have the mic on i want to say if you've noticed the budget conversations probably if you think around we heard a lot from barbara and we have beth parish over here our director of fiscal services and budget as well and hannah probably knows more about the budget than anybody outside of fiscal services which is critical because as the board's heard it takes a lot of resources to drive the uh, desires and pro outcomes we want for kids and so HANA plays a critical role in helping meld all that together um, in, in working with sites to make all these pieces we talk about actionable so I uh, just want to acknowledge that is a, a lot of learning from someone that uh, was a is a teacher and principal to to probably we could put her in the budget office and she'd function quite well that's been calling me accountant is that Anderson. is that a threat <laughs> They're a wonderful team, and I'm happy to work alongside them. Okay, in the, uh, for the next year, you saw these same goals, so no changes to goals since we shared them with you um, in May. The, main, the only change from last year to this year is uh, keeping the student groups identified in goal one that we are, in, uh, that we are truly watching and want to see an increase in their achievement, and then um, shifting to that ongoing continuous improvement model. Uh, the next two slides share uh, all of the, well, a, a combination of actions that are presented in uh, the LCAP for the 22-23 school year and how the supplemental funds align. You'll notice that these don't necessarily line up with that um, uh, 150 two pages document, I think, um, because these are specifically those uh, supplemental funds. So you'll see other funds. Um, but the, the, uh, we now include four expenditure tables in the end of the LCAP. And so in those expenditure tables, you'll notice that these funds align with the contributing expenditure tables. The other, the other expenditure tables shows the total investment by action. These are simply the ones aligned to that, that are, we're using supplemental funds. So for that, can I ask you, so for instance, on counselors, th this is hiring, I don't know how many that is, five, four, five, I don't know how many counselors that We is. are four additional elementary, but that's not what you're seeing here. So what can, is the 594? 
Okay, so the 594 is each of our nine secondary counselors, 20% of their uh, total salary is included um, because at our secondary sites, we want to ensure that they are spending time targeting um, and investing in our unduplicated students. And then this is two of the four elementary. The other two are funded with Title I funds. Okay, so I, I get that. This is um, it's hard. So I, number one, understanding their caseload to understand who the targeted kids to ensure that they know and that we are actually supporting them. So what, what I'd love to see in this scenario is that to the extent that there's waiting lists or there's who gets access to a counselor, we... Um, uh, Kids who are generating supplemental funds get, get get preferred access or even reach out access. And the, the thing that concerns me when you say 20% of a, what I'm hearing is they're already paid 100%. We're going to save a 20% by putting this in, and then we've just got 20%. What we did, we took money out of supplemental, and we put it back in general. So there are moments when this needs to happen, but they should be few and far between. And so it just jumps out, given the, the size of it relative to everything else, as as concerning. So I just want to make sure that if it's if that's driving it, we're making sure it's we're going overboard to support the kids that are that are uh, generating that revenue. And, and the, the other uh, piece that we're working to put more, frankly, accountability and making sure these students get the services is not more of just like if one of these students who's on a list shows up, you get in first because that that's wonderful and we want that. But it's also what are the actual targeted outreach services? So a student that's in this unduplicated people count. Um, how, what what is the expectation that counselors do to do outreach and do more services directed to them? Wh which I love. So the notion that I have 20% of my time is spent actually going out to Title I kids, finding them and making sure and actually checking to see what that, I love that. I, I'm not convinced that's going to, but no, yeah, I, I, I would that. I would agree that is, I would agree that that is not occurring now. Um, and is, it's, it's more of an, it's an intention, a desire versus a, here's an executed program. And that's what we're seeing in, for example, the scheduling placement piece of here's the list, what's the services met. So working with our secondary counselors, principals on, okay, so what is the specific outcomes of this time? What does targeted outreach and access mean in delivery of actual services? So literally like a middle school student will get check, check, check these things occurring that other students don't get because yeah. so it's more of not just you get to have a special color pass that comes in first versus no but I mean meaning that that means access versus these are service deliveries totally. for these students and it seems like what we were talking about before given this moment in time when the amount of wraparound supplement services that are provided out categoricals outside of this funding the notion of a counselor actually helping a a, a student actually connect those dots that know they have after school opportunities they might have they have free meals in a way they might have they're making sure that we're using that opportunity to make sure they know it seems like a unique and important opportunity and that's where expanding into elementary school where we've not had school based you know our own school uh, counselors uh, to put those in place to ensure that that also occurs as we have more of those extended learning opportunities and other pieces so this is really where we want to shift from intention to deliberate action and frankly accountability to ourselves to make sure these kids get what they need so that's a shift and I know that um, Marty and Beth Davidson met with secondary we met with our secondary counselors and principals just I think it was yesterday today to begin talking in those conversations around what are those structured service delivery pieces so that we can come back and report through our new data system that again the, all these things fit together that yeah. we can kind of almost put a label and track did these occur did they not what was the impact on, on students um, in, in our different measures uh, that we report so um, this is that whole alignment of those systems working together and, and frankly appreciate the leadership of the board um, in, in asking these questions because frankly these are pieces mm -hmm. that help drive drive the work um, when would we get our next update on that? I, I'm thinking I would love to see a mid-year update on specifically those three areas. I believe it was the targeted population groups, but I believe it was specifically homeless students in the ELA, suspensions, going off the top of my head, I think it was college and career readiness. That's where we saw those extreme yes. gaps. Could we focus our efforts there on our improving our student success specifically in those areas and then get a report back on that instead of waiting till the next round of dashboard data 
Something I think we can also do in those areas is include that into the presentations that we share around learning recovery um, and just make sure that we're highlighting those student groups. Absolutely. Uh, something worth noting as well in that previous conversation is we have th this year had more intentionality with our counselors to provide them training because uh, they, they also still have incredibly high caseloads and I want to make sure that we're conscious that they, they have a high number of students that they are trying to serve, four counselors for a school of 2,000 students, right? And so we're, having, we're asking a lot of them to then you know, add this, right? But it, they, they all want to uh, include these services for students. And so this year, we actually did, um, uh, I met with them a number of times earlier in the school year and actually re uh, worked with PCOE to provide some additional training for them to be able to have more knowledge of the services and supports that are available countywide to link students to services because it's sometimes maybe not as possible for all of our services to be provided within the district. It's also about looking at how do we connect students to services in the wide network of resources we have in our county and how can they um, invest time in, in, in that connection piece for students is, is a piece of the puzzle. Agree also with everything that was shared. So I appreciate that, and I, and I won't beat this one I'm down, but and I do actually really, on it. I do, for everyone, I appreciate how much has been, I, I know how much you focus on this, and I know how much you care, and you make sure that we're taken care of, and I, but I will say, like, to this, to the, I, I fully am aware how overwhelmed our counselors are, fully aware of it, and, and it, what I, but if we take 20% of supplemental dollars, it's no longer a choice. We have to ensure that we're supporting those kids, and their mentality is, I ha I, this is now what I have to do. So, thanks. Great. Thank you. Additional, um, additional investments uh, that we can see are the continued investment in a data tool aligned to goal one and our data assessment specialist. We will also be um, rolling out uh, the newly created K through six universal screener assessments in mathematics ne next year. And we spoke uh, in May about the uh, common essential skill alignment um, in goal one for secondary schools. And uh, another piece uh, worth noting here is uh, the continuation of breaking down the walls at our, uh, the investment in that at our secondary sites. In goal three area, you see um, the significant investment in our English learner students, both with the continuation of designated and integrated English learn language development and the continuation of what we trialed this year around parent liaisons. We'll be refining that program. Uh, and uh, Sarah Sores, our program specialist of English uh, language learners, will be um, uh, providing more information about that liaison um, work as we tighten and refine that moving into the 22-23 school year. Uh, and the last piece uh, here uh, to speak to Trustee Sadoff's uh, question is that that academic supports the MTSS for English language arts and site interventions remains a part of our supplemental investment, totaling those 5.4 million that were on the previous slide. We spent a significant amount of time in May talking about the increased or improved services. This is just a high level overview of the services provided um, to our socioeconomic disadvantaged students, including our homeless students, our foster youth, and our English learner students. Uh, I spoke earlier about the through line of all groups saying we needed increased communication. Um, we also talked about that in the A through G presentation this year. So increased communication of what are what is available um, and what am I uh, what do I need to take and how do I take it and who's making sure that I take it. Uh, and for college and career readiness, um, improving our tutoring, we have trialed a number of um, different tutoring programs and none of them are hitting the mark. So we are looking at. Uh, we are looking at uh, using Expanded Learning Opportunity Program to trial additional ideas specifically with our English learners. We have previously in the district had a family tutoring center that was um, successful and we would like to see uh, bringing back family tutoring because it meets not only that parent engagement bucket and making sure that we're um, providing parents with the tools to help their students but also um, helps, helps students with the work that they are trying to accomplish for their school and also skill deficit. And we could trial expanding that um, to our foster and uh, homeless youth as well, as well as our high need socioeconomic disadvantaged students. So just a few ideas that are out there that we are 
eager to try with the, with the addition of expanded learning funds. Um, we will also be training our uh, teachers in math strategies for English learner students, um, continuing facilitated data talks for students, providing family liaisons for increased home to school communication, case management um, through myself and Georgia, and then um, we talked about priority access um, the last couple of slides. So next steps for us are to respond to educational partner feedback, present the 22-23 uh, LCAP alongside the budget, um, actually before the budget, um, on June 22nd and submit to Placer County Office of Education, communicate our plan with our families, and then continue implementation and monitoring impact. Um, at this time, I am available for any questions and would uh, request a public hearing um, and also for you to authorize staff to make non-substantive changes to the LCAP between now and the end of the month as we find things that need fixing. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments? Okay. Thank you for all of your information and additional communication. We really appreciate it. Did you have something? Ooh, Adam, you need to open it before you yes. Adam. You need to open I it will. first. Oh. I just don't know. Okay, I have down board comments and questions, and then we open. And then, and then I ask for public okay. comment, yeah. I now open the public hearing for the RUSD 2022-23 Local Control and Accountability Plan. Are there any public comments? Seeing none, I now close the public hearing. Thanks. Thank you. Item 10.1, Math Improvement and Learning Recovery Update. Beth Davidson, Director of Academic Improvement and MTSS. Welcome. Good evening, President Price, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stock. I am excited to be here with you this evening to share an update on our progress and goals related to both math improvement and learning recovery. Uh, and I also would like to extend my appreciation uh, first and foremost to the board for um, really helping us focus on some high areas of need, specifically in the area of mathematics and for our student groups. Um, and additionally to the work this year of our teachers, our instructional aides, our site administrators, um, our MTSS team, and Director Anderson for her time with lifting a lot of things simultaneously into a system um, where we were just returning from COVID and there was a lot going on. So um, it's really neat to see the progress that our students have made um, and how our efforts have impacted students directly. So very grateful for a, a well-rounded team. So quickly, a goal review. Um, because we had so many things we were initiating in the system, I just wanted to take a moment to pause and create kind of an organizational chart of um, goals that we have. So we started the year with implementing a new model of learning recovery. So we have an annual goal that's tied to that about the percentage of students meeting or exceeding their growth target. So we'll show you some data related to that. Um, and then we also had a five-year goal that targets sort of two areas, both achievement-based, one in the percentage of students increasing, um, but increasing the percentage of students meeting or exceeding standard as measured by the CASP assessment over a five-year period, and also a specific focus on some of our student groups. So we're looking to close the achievement gap there by increasing the percentage by 10% for meeting or exceeding on the CASP. In the meantime, um, mid-year, our mass steering committee landed on goals that they find most relevant to their work. So for grades three through eight, their goal is similar to the five-year goal I mentioned earlier about CAS, but they're using MAP as a metric because they know they can progress monitor, and we know there's a strong correlation between MAP scores as a predictor for performance on the CASP, on the state assessment. Um, so they have two goals related there. One is achievement focus, so looking at a 5% gain for all students over a five-year period. And they also have a growth element to the goal. So again, focusing on our student groups, looking for them to grow each of those groups, growing the percentage of students meeting or exceeding their growth target by 10%. For high school, we have landed on utilizing the pass rate for integrated one, two, and three. 
as our current metric. Um, so all of these together will lead towards and we will provide um, updates in terms of progress towards that five-year goal using CASP as the metric. So this evening, we'll start with some um, updated math data that's related to the math improvement goals, and then we will follow with um, some goals and data related specifically to learning recovery. Beth, can I ask you a question? I'm curious, I haven't thought about this before, but the five-year goal around using CASP, so I appreciate that math, they thought differently, mm -hmm. which makes perfect sense. And even in learning recovery, given how we're only looking at a subset of 11th graders, really, is there, and, and I, 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 like, is there any other way you think in a five-year goal to think about, I just, I just wonder how much we actually capture what's happening in our high schools by looking at that single assessment for a very small subset of our kids. Agreed, and I think that's why, um, the mass steering committee landed on grades because it's what we have and it's what we know and we know there's a strong correlation between grades and SAT scores for example so it so can be, be a strong I'm totally predictor. on board with what that I'm saying on the learning recovery I wonder if there's a way to take that thinking into that area as well yeah and we can talk about that again at the end and maybe come back and revisit the goal I think it certainly can um, move and change I find, over I find time. that compelling I actually appreciate what they did at yeah. the secondary level so okay mm -hmm. thanks And of our three presentations, I have the most slides, but I promise I will do my best to be succinct. And some of these are just a, a minor update um, that was provided previously, so I will go through those relatively quickly, but please stop me if you have questions. So this slide is an example of that. So um, at the April board study session that we had, I presented this timeline with an update for the spring 2022 um, percentage of students meeting or exceeding standard on the spring map test and there was just a slight adjustment and increase in the percentage of students who met or exceeded from when we shared that information in April so in April the percentage was 66.41 it is currently at 67.19 most of that is because we had a, a couple elementary sites who hadn't completed their testing yet so we were missing a small percentage of student scores and then similarly for middle school, most of the students had completed their testing when we reported in April. So you see just a slight increase there, a tenth of a percent uh, from the April, April reporting spring data until now. And then this is a, a slightly different chart than we've utilized in the past. So um, in some discussions with um, Trustee Counter, who I know couldn't be with us this evening, but I appreciate his perspective. Um, just trying to make it really clear since we have so many goals, like what's the goal, what's the target, and did we meet it or not? Um, so this graph, hopefully, uh, gives us some strides towards, towards meeting that goal. So again, our five-year goal focused on um, CASP for our district goal, and then again, our mass steering is looking at the MAP assessment, which is the data we have available now. If we look at grades three through eight, we see that last year, for 2021, we had 63% of students meeting or exceeding standard using the MAP assessment, and currently we're at 64% for this school year, so we see about a 1% increase. Looking at elementary, so if we break it down a little bit, they went from 66 to 67, and then middle school, 58 to 57, and you may be thinking, like, that's a net sum of zero. What's, what's happening? Um, I can do math, I promise. The, it's a rounding issue, so we didn't put the tenths of percents on there, but if you look overall district-wide for grades three through eight and we aggregate all of those scores, it's approximately a 1% change increase from last year. So that would put us on target towards meeting a 5% growth in five years. Then this chart breaks down um, the data a little bit further. So we're again looking from spring of last year to spring of this year, so 2021 to 2022. Um, but this graph shows information on our student groups because we know that's the second part of our long-term or five-year goal. So again, we're looking for um, the percentage of students meeting or exceeding standard to grow by 10% in a five-year time period or approximately a little bit less than 2% per year would let us allow us to meet that goal. So you can see overall there, we had a 1% gain 
and this is for grades three through eight, this graph. And then we have it broken down by student group. So the next two bars are showing the percentage of students in the exceeding, which is blue. The on level or meeting standard is the green. Um, the yellow is strategic, and then the red intensive. So we're looking for students to be in the blue and green areas. So for our socioeconomically disadvantaged students, you can see from last spring to this spring, we have a 12% gain for that student group, a 2% gain for our English learners, and a 5% gain for students with disabilities. So we are on track to meet that goal as well after one year. Beth? Oh. No, please. Can I actually jump back for one sure. quick minute? Um, and I know, oh, this last year, the last years have been, <laughs> brought many, many challenges. And so please know when, when I'm asking or looking, I am so appreciative of the incredible work and how great our students are doing and your entire team. Um, just a thought um, that I'm having, as I'm looking at this 5% goal, um, and we're talking about over five years, third graders through eighth graders having a 5%, I, I would like us to be careful that one grade making a large amount of growth doesn't skew that data for us. I would love to see all students, and, and I know this is not, yeah. um, this is ideal, <laughs> that all students would achieve a 5% growth in five years. Um, and so I see this year there was really the elementary kind of skewed that a little bit to give us an overall 1%, which is still great. It's been a great year. There's schools throughout the, the state that are really, really struggling. So I, I want you to hear me so appreciative. Um, but I want us to be careful the next four years of our five-year goal that we're not allowing any one data set or grouping to skew that. Because um, we could have one class that maybe has 20% growth, and then we go, look, we had this overall. Um, so I'd love to see us find a way that we're looking at to make sure, as much as possible, all students are hitting that 5% growth. I appreciate that comment. And um, our mass steering committee had a very similar discussion and asked specifically that we report out on aggregated and disaggregated data by grade. So we will be sure to do that. I, I was just going to uh, pause on slide seven, and we'll see the consider, but but. This is super exciting. It is. I mean, super exciting. I, I recognize it's one year we're on the track. Um, I also appreciate, to Tiffany's point, like uh, our kids in poverty, socioeconomic disadvantaged kids, later on you'll see a huge bump, which is why you see the 12% here, so it's a little skewed. But this is super exciting. And, and I think we have put a lot of focus on our interventions, on making sure we're reaching them and handling all the back and forth. But there, this appears that we're at least on the right track, and that's, uh, that's exciting. So. Great. Okay, so this is disaggregating the data a little bit further, looking at elementary. So similar graph to what you saw on the previous slide, but only for grades three through six. And here we do start to see um, some areas of relative strength for elementary and then some areas for uh, targeted growth as well. So um, our socioeconomically disadvantaged students for grades three through six, we see an 8% gain from last spring to this spring. Our English learners, a 2% decrease and then our students with disabilities of 5% gain. Can, can you talk about that? Because that obviously jumps out a lot, the mm -hmm. EL. Um, and I know we have quite a few newcomers. I don't know if that's what's yes. driving this, but yeah. So we have so. Um, Sarah Soares, our um, program specialist who oversees our English learner program, has um, noted a significant increase in the number of students who are English learners enrolling, specifically coming in at the level one and with level no two. Language. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And similar data. For no, sorry, are they coming in all throughout elementary? Or are they t they tend to be at the lower grades, or do they truly tend to be all throughout? Question: Do you know, Director Anderson? I mean, I'm thinking. What I'm thinking about is our chance of reclassifying by the time they're mid to middle school. So what we're seeing actually one. is an influx of students, primarily in the elementary and then the high school levels. And so we are uh, looking to address that next year with, but but don't have specific information about whether they're in primary or intermediate. But we're not um, having a non non insignificant number of level one ELs coming at the high school level. We are having a, a, yes. Oh. Yeah, yes, and so we are looking at adding um, ELD uh, sections to from address Ukraine, that from, need. Mm -hmm. I think it's Ukraine yes. probably. Is so we are having an increased number of refugee students right. um, come into the district, and then we are also having um, students who have moved to the district um, uh, 
inside of the last couple of year period who are moving at the high school level with um, in the level one and two range, and we can provide trustees specific information about what our trajectory of um, enrollment has been for English learners and um, what their level um, is. We're tracking that very closely, and we're starting, we're actually going to spend time this summer revamping the way that we look at staffing for our English uh, language development program, making sure that the staffing level matches the needs, specifically looking at if you have a higher number of ones and twos, right, students scoring in the novice, right, or just beginning levels, you're going to need more support um, for those students. For sure. And that and I, would speak to the dashboard data we were just looking at as well. That would actually be a direct correlation there, I'm sure. Uh, yes, the homeless that is population. potentially something we will see in this coming dashboard, I would anticipate, right? It was not necessarily something that was present on the 2019 dashboard, but it is something we're anticipating seeing on this next dashboard, and we're seeing all of those students just recently took the summative LPAC, and many of them the initial, and then a couple of weeks later the summative, because that's what happens when you move here close to the end of the year. Um, and so we'll be able to provide further information on that. Soon. So one thing I'd also be interested in seeing, especially for uh, our K through two newcomers, is so proficiency matters, but it's no guarantee of reclassification. And so actually paying attention to reclassification, I would hope that K through two, we could actually expect to reclassify by the time they went to middle school and seeing how we're doing on that especially if the numbers increase. Absolutely, and we actually have a high rate of reclassification in the district, and so that is going to be something too. These numbers include um, uh, redesignated fluent English proficient they students. They do, I was They do, that. and so sometimes we don't um, present data that they, they are included in here. They, they are included in so this So a, a negative 2% includes RFEPs. It does. So it's much higher, actually. How many RFEPs are in there? That is not information I have off the top of my head, but we can get That's it concerning. It. Okay. So, so uh, trustee, based on the conversation, what we'll do is we'll have staff bring I'm back. I'm sorry, I use an acronym. So reclassified fluent, so kids who've gone through the cross and been reclassified. Right, and, w and one of the reasons why we like to track them, even though after they're designated English proficient, is we want to make sure that like, it sticks. So we, 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 tra we trail them in a sense of making sure, and typically they can be some of the highest performing students in our district on test scores um, because of that criteria for reclassification. Um, they often out, that single group often outperforms all other, any other group we have, um, which is amazing. Uh, the, the other piece I'll note is on this is we'll ask staff to bring back to the board in the early fall a kind of a updated census, if you will, on our English learner enrollment, uh, comparing a couple years, and then also the levels they're in, so the board can see, you know, really what does that look like, where is it occurring, um, so, so you'll have that information. Right. So for middle school, similar data, um, our English learners, we see a 24% jump in the percentage on level or exceeding. Um, our English learners, a 6% gain, and our students with disabilities, an 8% gain. And I, I mean, I want to pause and absolutely celebrate our students uh, who are in the socioeconomically disadvantaged group for middle school. It is phenomenal. Uh, but we do want to uh, look for a pattern or a trend over time because it's important for us to keep in mind the end size increase pretty significantly from spring 2021 to 2022. So we have a variable there. Um, and we also um, have a 50% turnover at our middle school since we're only grades seven and eight. So we will continue to monitor that and hopefully see ongoing success in that and, area. And a huge admin turnover at our middle schools that we're about to, you know, right? Yes. So it's, it's gonna be a huge year to try to maintain this. Okay, then on to grade data. So again, as a reminder, our goal from the Mass Steering Committee, five-year goal, we are looking to increase the percentage of students passing our integrated course series. So a different pass rate for integrated one, two, and three. And again, this is only for students in grades nine through 12. So this would not include students at our middle school level taking the integrated one course. Um, their baseline was established based on calculating a three-year average from pre-pandemic and then the most recent um, end of course data that they had after our uh, uh, return from distance learning. Can I ask you a question about that? I like it. How did they get, you know, the, how did they decide on the 80 to 86 and 89 to 92? 
great what question. What were their Yeah, so thoughts? they um, took a very realistic viewpoint as a teacher and said, okay, imagine your class in front of you, how many students on average are in these courses, how many realistically do we see that we can increase from a no mark or a no credit to a pass? in a year's time. So if we're to take on you know, one specific initiative or strategy we're utilizing, how do we make that progression over time so that all of these are at least hitting that 85% threshold. Um, so you, you know, the ceiling's a little bit different for integrated three of a different population of students taking that yep. course. Um, so that's why you see us a little bit smaller of a range there. Yeah, thank you. Great question. So our updated data, which is preliminary, so this does not include any students who will have a grade change as a result of their work in summer school. Um, so we have 81.4% pass rate for integrated one. For integrated two, 77.5%. And then for integrated three, a 92.2. So I put a column on the end of this table that shows the change in percentage from the baseline that was established by the Mass Steering Committee. So we are on target for integrated one and integrated three in terms of the gains there from their baseline. Integrated two, we have some work to do and the teachers um, I think would clearly be able to articulate this before they even saw these percentages that we really see our integrated two students as a whole struggling and they are looking at some new and different ways to approach students, especially those who may need to repeat the course next school year for what the structure of the course looks like, um, how students are placed and identified to need targeted assistance, um, and some strategies that they are utilizing. Are these kids typically sophomores? It depends. They typically are sophomores or they could be juniors. It, it's interesting to think about when COVID hit those kids. Yes. Right? At really critical times. Very significantly for math. impacted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we see that on the social emotional side mm -hmm. as well in terms of maturity. In fact, we were looking um, today in the high school counseling meeting at the uh, referrals for Wellness Together and our two highest grade levels by far are eighth grade and 11th grade. Mm -hmm. You know, and just one note on that, um, I, I think we can look back totally understand this last year. I do think integrated two is critical for two components. One, chemistry highly relies on a student doing well in integrated two. Um, and then, because I, I think a lot of times we'll focus on integrated one, it's critical that they have that foundation, right? But integrated two can sometimes be a determining factor for A through G completion too. And so I would love to see us focus on that integrated two because I think we would probably see a direct correlation with students that maybe maybe don't move forward with A through G completion. And it probably, I wonder if it would actually, that might be a big reason why is our integrated two. Um, as a mom of a, a junior uh, that took integrated two this year, I know um, integrated two opens a lot of conversations um, and it affects a lot of other classes that they have. So I'd love to see us, this could just be extrapolated data for one year that was abnormal. I know we've had, we've had a couple abnormal years, um, but uh, as a mom of a junior, I would be concerned about us maybe refocusing a little on that integrated two to see if that would help us up our A through G completion. Agreed. I, th I certainly think there's a through line there and a connection. Um, we also do not have the same number of everyday or support sections at 10th grade that we do at 9th. So we are adding some sections there and trialing some different things. So it'll be interesting to see how the data pans out. Ms. Davidson, if I could, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Beth and our math instructional coach, Danielle Martling. They, they recognize this. They've already met with the teachers. Some of our teachers are going to come in, even though they're on summer break, really to, to work on this. So just a shout out to the great work Beth and Danielle have been doing. Thank you. And the teachers have been so inspiring. They're so open-minded and are trying to integrate um, some executive functioning curriculum that Danielle has been able to research and has been recommended by our school psychologists, um, some other social emotional curriculum around resiliency and that growth mindset and how they build that into the content. It's gotta be so refreshing for them as well that we have you know, so much energy and support behind them. Absolutely. So that's great. So a different look, so this is aggregated data for integrated one, two, and three courses together. So you can see um, all of them together, the pass rate is 83.2% for all students. And then we have it disaggregated by student group and we do start to see some achievement gaps here, um, specifically in the area of integrated two is where we see the largest achievement gap in terms of pass rates um, and primarily with our socioeconomically disadvantaged group. 
I'd also be curious to the access and end size issue, whether or how many ELs or students would do, are you making into integrated three? Okay, so we will shift to learning recovery. So we'll provide some updates in that area and then look at next steps. So here is um, an image that sort of shows everything all together in terms of learning recovery. So we have the percentage of students who met or exceeded their growth target. And again, for grades three through eight, we're using MAP as our measurement tool. For nine through 12, we use IXL. Um, and we did land in a space of utilizing IXL as a diagnostic or measurement tool specifically for our learning recovery students rather than all students this spring. So that's why you see um, an empty column right there. We don't have that comparison. Um, and while we didn't meet our goal of 85% of students meeting or exceeding their growth target in elementary or middle school levels um, or at the high school, they are outperforming the all student group in terms of the percentage meeting or exceeding their growth target. This is some um, information by student group, again, looking at the percentage of students meeting or exceeding their growth target as measured by the MAP assessment. So we have all students who receive learning recovery services for grades three through six in the uh, left-hand column at 58%. And then you can see for our um, identified student group, socioeconomically disadvantaged was close at 53. Our English learners actually grew at a higher percentage than um, all of the students in learning recovery, and then our students with disabilities at 53%. And then for the middle school level, um, all of our students in learning recovery is so that overall percentage at 53%. Again, not meeting that 85, but they did outperform the all student group. So all students at the seventh and eighth grade levels, um, the percentage who met or exceeded their growth target was 49%. And again, here you can see our English learners uh, with a, a relatively high growth percentage of 57%. One thing I wanted to note to go back to the previous slide about elementary, we see here our English learners are growing at 61%. So they're actually the highest performing student group. Uh, which looks a little bit different when you look at achievement data, right? We saw that they were actually decreasing in terms of achievement. Um, so I think part of that does go back to we're looking at a slightly different population of students when we have more at the level one and level two. So we will continue to monitor that. At the high school level, um, we've shared this data previously in terms of IXL growth by grade level but we do have updated grade data to look at our different interventions we had available this year. So this is by course. So for integrated one, the chart on the left is showing a comparison of all students. This is the pass rate at the end of the year. Again, this is before any grade changes for summer school. So you may see these numbers increase. Our learning recovery students had a 54% pass rate. Everyday math had an 83.6, so actually a higher percentage than the all student group. And I just did wanna distinguish learning recovery versus everyday math. Um, anyone in learning recovery would be a model that was different than the everyday math model. So it might be, have been more of a learning center model um, or another support course that uh, was taught by a different teacher. So did, did no one in everyday math receive, receive learning recovery? Could there be some in, the, in both? There are some in both, yes. Okay. But in terms of how we pulled the data, if it was identified as a learning recovery course and it was every day, it's in the everyday I see. column only. I see, I see. Is learning recovery like math foundations? Or that's something separate? Yes. That would be learning recovery every day math would be everyday math on this. And chart. it's a little bit of semantics. So we call learning recovery, we had funding associated with that. So our uh, principals worked with their math teams to identify sections that they wanted to target and progress monitor. Yes. And then for integrated two, we see um, the all student group. We have a little bit um, of disparity between the all and the learning recovery pass rates. And then the everyday as well as about 10% lower for integrated two. And then integrated three, we have a 100% pass rate um, for the everyday sections we had, which is great. So we will come back in 
either August or September to provide updated um, percentages to you in terms of pass rates that account for any grade changes that occurred um, through the work of students during summer school. And then this slide, last slide on grade data, this is everyday math by student group on the left and then learning recovery by student group pass rates on the right. It's pretty fascinating, I mean obviously <coughs> this highly argues everyday math is, is effective, it's also insanely more expensive than mm -hmm. learning recovery so it's not doable for every kid but it certainly does, it certainly does Call an access issue of who gets who gets access to everyday math versus those. That are, and I, I would also say too, like as I'm looking at the integrate, what I'd love to see. I know we don't really have it because of COVID, but I'd love to sort of see these kids who are in the, the, the end of learning recovery. If you think about those, how we determine who got in learning recovery, went back the last couple of years, and those that didn't get in learning recovery, where their proficiency rates. And I think even though you're not at a, you're not at a you're only 54 percent, it was probably. 2% before, or I imagine something. So you definitely see an increase, which is exciting. And we heard our learning recovery teachers articulate that consistently, yeah. is that they may see a student with a 30 point gain um, in terms of their pass rate towards the class. They're just not at the threshold yet. So we wanna continue to support them. Which of course, why being able to look at growth is so huge. Right. Okay, and then something that was requested um, after the last study session with our teachers was what are some common themes from our sites who are experiencing the highest levels of growth. So this is information that was either observed by um, our MTSS team and was also shared by our learning recovery teachers and their site administrators. So a focus on relationships and making sure that students have a bond with the learning recovery teacher and all of the staff in the classroom. Social emotional integration, so a focus was made on perseverance, the growth mindset, and again, developing a safe space. And some of that had to do with um, questioning strategies that were utilized with students. So a lot of training went into um, that preparation, not only with the teacher, but with the instructional aides running small groups as well. Collaboration and communication was a main theme. Um, with grade level teachers. So making sure that there was a feedback loop to say this is what we're working on or the grade level teacher could say, hey, I really noticed they're struggling with this, this specific concept. Flexible grouping, so making sure that students had the opportunity to either work with the teacher for one portion and then the instructional aid for a different rotation or that students could come and go from um, their time in learning recovery so that there didn't have to be a fixed or set amount of time that the student was in there. We could add a student later if we identified a need or a student who was showing significant progress maybe didn't need to stay in there as long as their peers. And then consistency in schedule, making sure that there was protected time for those students to have access to the learning recovery program, which we know was a huge struggle uh, with the number of absences we had with students and our staff getting pulled to sub in other programs. Using, utilizing small groups, so three to four seems to be kind of the magic number um, that was reported in terms of the highest levels of effectiveness with running small group instruction with the intervention curriculum to make sure that we could implement it with fidelity. And then having experience and trained instructional aides, this was articulated over and over again. Um, they see lots of students and they have very little prep time in between the student groups that are coming in from different grade levels. So you can imagine um, the scramble they're having and the materials preparation. So having people who are experienced and we're investing in them in terms of making sure that they have the knowledge and skill set um, to work with students daily was huge. And then lastly, they said fun, just making sure it's an environment where students wanted to attend daily. Um, they heard lots and lots of positive comments from students about how exciting uh, a place it was for them and that they really enjoyed math. So that shift in mindset for a lot of students who historically have struggled. Beth, a quick comment on this slide. I really appreciate this slide because I think it's great to look at, okay, we know we're being successful in many areas. Okay, how are we being successful and why is one thing working for one, maybe not another? Um, I will say at our last uh, board study session, I loved being able to sit with some of the teachers and then actually share, here's what we're doing in our everyday math. Here's what's being successful. I will say, I did hear multiple times, ah, my aid gets pulled for this or gets pulled for that or, and I, I completely understand. How do we help with that? Or is there a way that we can really protect, maybe we look at like integrated two, 
um, that we really protect and say, hey, that's that's not an area we can pull from. It's just not an option. We need to find another solution. Because uh, I could imagine that many students in the classroom, it is incredibly unrealistic <laughs> to expect the students that are really needing that small group support that's been successful at some areas if one or two classes tend to have their aid pulled a lot. Agreed. Thoughts on that? We haven't landed on a great solution, um, but we will keep looking at um, viable options. Part of the struggle was we, our um, special education students, some of them have a one on one IEP written, or excuse me, aid written into their IEP, so we have an obligation to make sure that we're providing that support. Um, some of our aides are. Um, subs in the district so they got pulled to be a teacher sub where we didn't have anyone to fill that void um, and elementary proves to be especially challenging because you have fewer people the teachers um, aren't able to cover on their prep because they don't necessarily get it every day so there are some significant challenges but we will continue to look at protecting that time as much as possible we completely agree and see the value in that interesting <laughs> we still continue to pay pre above pre-covid rates for substitute teachers i mean we we are, are working to be competitive. We compare around the, with other districts. And then we also, and this is a very sad thing to share, um, we, in order to make sure we can try to protect the learning going on, the professional development that's needed because it's so critical, have even worked in cabinet to look at a matrix of how do we deploy district office personnel to go out and sub on a rotational schedule. And this includes like the chief technology officer. This includes uh, Beth and Hannah and, and others in our areas because we know we have to mitigate the impact on any one segment of the district and we hope we don't have to use this like we did this last year but we know we need to be prepared instead of have hope so we really um, are working to try to protect those spaces and, 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 and spread impact so that we don't lose momentum or work in any, any significant area. And we hope we don't have to deploy those types of plans, um, but we're, we're working to be as competitive and we're even working to think about how we support schools and direct like recruitment of subs from their own school because you may be willing to be, you know, I'll sub at Breen because I'm a parent at Breen. And so we're trying to look at all kinds of ways to um, not have that type of occurrence be, and also hiring of some, of, especially our classified employees from the school, specific school communities in which they live in. So we, we have a bunch of things going because we don't want the impacts that we had um, this year. So can I ask um, Tiffany's question in a slightly different way? Because I totally agree. I, I was also a little of this slide. And um, so I appreciate her comment, her question about how you protect it. I was also curious, and Roger and I were having this conversation around, so we now have an idea of what works in Rockland in our context. So from a district office perspective, I'd like to understand, not tonight, but over the next months, what is our spread and scale strategy to those who, th those early adopters who picked up this, how do we make sure that those who may not have, have access to this, and actually we make sure we're spreading these best practices consistently so every child has access to them regardless of what classroom they're in. Absolutely. <laughs> We're going to talk about that in the next slide a little bit. Um, so we are going to make a shift in our goals for 22-23. So now that we have sort of a foundation and better understand what our learning recovery model looks like, we will be making some shifts in our learning recovery model to include uh, a coaching aspect so that we can start to spread um, the knowledge and sort of integrate that into all of our practices campus-wide in different settings. Um, so we will be, we're not getting rid of learning recovery, um, so we will embed that in our mass steering goals so that we can progress monitor there using MAP as our metric towards meeting our five-year goal related to CAS because we know there's a correlation there. So I'll show you what that looks like. So this is our plan for 22-23. Um, so we will use the math steering goal around the percentage of students meeting or exceeding standard on math and then... Um, hopefully increasing the percentage of students meeting or exceeding their growth target on MAP as indicators towards meeting our five-year goal. And then for um, the high school area, we, are, we will continue to monitor progress towards our um, pass rates in the integrated course series. And we will be uh, reporting, we're gonna include learning recovery as one of our student groups so that we can continue to progress monitor 
using the map metrics and then for high school, our grades, um, and then we'll report annually on CASP data as well. So I like that, I think it's interesting. Can, can I ask though, like, so we look at targeted subgroups in a five-year goal, but we don't in our progress monitoring. We do look at it in our progress monitoring, so three through eight, grades three through eight, that second bullet point is looking at student groups in when it terms says exceeding of their growth targets, there is targeted, so is that what you mean? Yeah, so if the English learners overall in grades three through eight had a percentage of 54% meeting or exceeding their growth target, we would want that to increase to 64% for that student group Okay. over the course of five years. Okay, I, I guess I thought there was referring back to, we, we will increase the percentage of students, which I read to be all students. So you're saying you, we are gonna disaggregate all of these and expect the 10% in all of disaggregated grades. Yes. Okay. Then just a reminder, this is our math improvement journey for this year, so we have done a systems investigation. Um, our math steering committee has really expanded their learning around continuous improvement and what that model looks like. We have engaged and trialed different PDSAs at each of our sites. We have implemented common assessments and trialed them and received feedback um, for grades K through six, and we'll be working on secondary next year. We have implemented our learning recovery program and served over 12 hundred students and then next step so looking at next year and beyond we will be exploring and adapting our learning recovery and intervention models um, at all levels at elementary middle and high school we'll be providing ongoing training in both tier one and tier two instruction so really starting to shift uh, as trustee miller mentioned towards how do we take what we've learned in the learning recovery setting and get that knowledge to transfer and that skill set to transfer about what works in Rockland to all of our students and our staff. We are piloting um, two different digital math programs in summer school. So if any, anyone is interested in seeing how the students engage or what the platforms look like, it is fascinating. We had training today. Um, and then our uh, secondary campuses will be looking at a, the possibility of a digital math component as well uh, for our everyday or our intervention courses. And then we are also piloting um, an intervention curriculum in summer school for elementary that focuses on developing fluency, so really building that bridge between um, fluence, fact fluency and the conceptual understanding so that we don't see them as isolated, but it's really an integrated approach. And that has come out as a, a significant area of need from our teachers, particularly those participating on the Mass Steering Committee. We are developing common essential skills and assessments to progress monitor, identifying high leverage change ideas and PDSAs that we may be able to scale up, either including more teachers in a similar setting or trying, trialing it in a different setting. We are expanding our participants who are engaged in continuous improvement. Our PD committee has really um, supported enhancing new teacher support, training, and mentorship. So we'll be um, partnering with our TPA to really explore what that looks like. Um, we're revising our uh, new teacher induction, so our beginning of the school year training opportunities we have and really how we welcome staff, make sure they understand the culture of Rockland. Um, and then providing ongoing training to them throughout the year. Sometimes we tend to fire hose them the first two days. <laughs> uh, and then they're kind of, I don't want to say left to their own, but they can only take in a certain space and you don't know what you don't know. So giving them a month or so to implement curriculum and then come back and say, okay, what space are we in and how can we help you continue to grow and better understand and utilize um, our curriculum. And then we will also be engaging with our administrators at the site level, so both principals and assistant principals, um, to increase their knowledge around continuous improvement and specific uh, math improvement strategies, what they can look for in classrooms and how they can support the staff and students as well. So lots to look forward to. Thank you. Trustees, you can see your wise investment in the math goal you set of creating a structure, a team, and the systems, and really Beth's leadership supported by, by Marty and Bill, of course, and Han and the whole team of just really putting this into action from where we started a year ago of just actually asking you to approve in the budget these resources to you can see a year later the impact they're having and, and appreciate the board's ongoing investment over multiple years to really uh, ensure this becomes part of how we teach children in Rockland. Thank you. Thank you.
appreciate all of your hard work and details. Thank you. We will now open agenda item 11.1, .1, public comment on non-agenda items. Thank you for waiting so long. We want to remind everyone that this agenda item is to give anyone in attendance the opportunity to ask questions or discuss non-agenda items with the board. The board is not permitted to deliberate or take action on non-agenda items, but may refer the matter to a staff member for follow-up. When you approach the podium, please state your name, the city you live in, and the school your children attend. You will have three minutes to address the board, and all comments must be respectful and professional. Our first comment is Jerry Dodge. Sure. Patrick, how do you say your last name? Wibbler. Wibbler, welcome. Thank you for letting us speak tonight. Um, my name is Jerry Dodge. I am a Rockland resident. I don't have kids in Rockland schools anymore. They're all grown up. They're in their 20s, but uh, they all graduated from Whitney High School, went through the um, school system, and we, we love being here. We've been here for a quarter century. Um, I'm also the uh, head cross country coach at Whitney High School, have been for seven years. Um, reason why we're here uh, is, to, is to talk about uh, coach stipends. Um, uh, for years, the uh, cross country team, the cross country program, Whitney and Rockland has had the fewest district stipends and the lowest dollar amount in those stipends. Um, just wanted to give you an idea of kind of what, what, what we have. Um, we have six different divisions, actually seven at the section level, but that's, <laughs> so Frosh Soft Boys, Frosh Soft Girls, JV Boys, JV Girls, Varsity Boys, Varsity Girls, so a lot of levels to keep track of. Um, within each squad, we have multiple uh, skill levels, of course, fitness level, running experience, um, age, pace, et cetera, to keep track of. Um, we've grown the program at Whitney um, about double in the last few years. We're up to an average of about 70 student athletes, so it's a large program. We currently have three assistant coaches, uh, so there's four of us total, but again, only the two uh, district stipends. With this model, our, our student to coach ratio, ratio is exceeding 30 to one, and uh, um, close to 40, uh, 40 to one, as, as recently we had an, a roster of 78 runners. <clears throat> so, um, at this point, um, we're still at, stu at two stipends. Um, last night, we were at our cross-country parent meeting, and we were told that, I guess, within the, 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 the negotiation of the contract, there's still some discussion of uh, possibly uh, one more, maybe a JV assistant coach stipend is what we heard, so we thought we'd come here and just and make an appeal for that, uh, for cross-country to be considered for a third, uh, for a third district stipend. Um, Okay, so I'll let Pat go from there. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my name is Pat Wibbler. Uh, as, as I said, I have two kids in Rockland. Uh, actually, one just graduated from Whitney High School. Uh, she'll Congratulations. Be attending Colorado. Thank you. She'll be attending Colorado School of Mines in the fall. Um, we're really proud and very happy. And I just want to say thank you uh, first for the education that my kids are getting. My, uh, my second uh, child, uh, my son, uh, he's an entering junior at Whitney. Uh, both of them have been on the cross country team. It's an incredible experience for them. Um, mm -hmm. It's a sort of family environment. Uh, and what, what Jerry didn't say is that these four coaches provide a really, really unique experience for the kids. They can provide personalized attention. Um, and the, the reason I'm here is because when I look at it, it looks a little inequitable to me between one sport to the other. Um, and I'm really not here to say that, you know, the other sport shouldn't have what they have. Football has 11, but they have a very large program. It's a very successful program. Um, they, those kids get individualized attention because of their different positions. Um, but I think the same is true for cross country. Um, and I, I can't help but think as the parent of a daughter that maybe this inequity might accidentally be the result of long-term you know, uh, gender bias, um, just maybe even accidentally. And, and uh, that might not be the explanation, but it might. And so what I'd, what I'd like to ask is that the, the district and the board take a closer look at this issue, um, not just for cross country. You may actually find uh, in, in other sports as well, when we look, we see softball versus baseball is two versus three. Um, so like I said, I'm not sure that this is the reason. 
there may be a better reason, but I just ask you to take a closer look. Um, also, you know, just from my perspective, I'm biased. I happen to like cross country, so that's why I'm asking you to look. Um, but um, that that sport in particular uh, is is just super important to the to the kids that participate in it. So uh, just please just take a look and thank you for for listening. Thank you, Superintendent Stock. Can you, uh, um, gentlemen? Since we are so close to the end of the meeting, I believe I'm going to ask if you can just wait a couple more minutes because sure. you've been so patient tonight. And uh, part of our uh, tentative agreement with our teachers union involves some st athletic stipends. I'm going to ask either a Dr. Limoges or Mr. Flowers to maybe, if they have off the top of their head, be able to update you briefly on some of the status because some of those concerns you have, may, I believe, may have been addressed. And so, if you stick around to the conclusion, they can hopefully update you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for your time and appreciate uh, all that you do for your athletes. Thank, Thank you. you. Trustees, do you have any items to be placed on the pending agenda? Okay, um, the meeting is now adjourned.